Well, thank you so much. And it seems like the youth band, revived band, is they're growing this way, aren't they? Bit broader shoulders and taller in stature, and it's really neat to see them grow musically as well as to to grow physically too. Um, well, I'm Pastor Joey, and it's well, great to welcome you here today. Um, two or three things that we we're going to be talking about here today. One is uh, I'm going to do a Q&A um, with some, uh, a very wonderful couple that's really championing a piece of the overall uh, picture of what Stones Hill will look like in days going forward. And so I'll have them come up in just a second to do that. Uh, we're also in a series and um, the series is One Hit Wonders, and we're looking at the chapters in the Bible, books of the Bible, that only have one chapter. Um, and you may not be familiar with the Bible, and that's okay. We're, we don't assume that you are Bible experts here on Sunday morning. But if you would like to read ahead, um, next week we'll be looking at the book of Third John. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at the book of Second John. And, uh, you know, we are a church that takes biblical studies uh, and presentation of truth very, as a very high core value and, and very important point. And so we just preach the Bible. And so I uh, just want to let you know that right up front. Uh, we're just going to keep preaching the Bible, explaining the Word, applying the Word, living the Word. And uh, so we did Second John a few weeks ago. We're going to do Third John next week. And today, uh, as the Lord leads, uh, what I'll do is I'm actually going to look at the author of those two one-hit wonders, the, the life of John himself. And so today I'll give you just a little brief biography of his life. We'll learn some things from his life, and I think you're going to see some things there that you can apply to your own life. Okay, and so that's kind of uh, where things are headed here this morning. Um, to orient you to uh, bigger picture things, and by the way, if you're here on college break, you've had a fall break, I, we welcome you back from college. I hope that that's going well for all of you, and I hope you're all enjoying the sunshine, the changing of the leaves. God is good. I saw a quote yesterday. It said, uh, there's two things that awe me in life, two things that amaze me, the starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. And God has made this beautiful world, and the heavens, the leaves, the sunshine, the beauty of it is awesome. And he's also made a moral law, and it's in our hearts. And if we, we know right from wrong many times, don't we? And it's written into who we are. And, um, and the beauty is, if there's a moral law wit written within, there's a moral law giver. Uh, by extension. And so we can be encouraged by the fact that there is a God and, and our desire this morning is to honor him in every way and to build the kind of community that he'd have us to build in order to be effective in, um, in only raising our families but nurturing us in the faith and helping us to be the positive influence he wants us to be in the community. So thank you for being here and being a part of this morning with us. Okay, let's go to slide 15 really quickly. And this is, uh, I think Pastor Debbie's already mentioned this to you, but we've got a huge ministry focus coming up at the beginning of 2016. It's called The Story, uh, Children and Youth and Small Groups, and many will be started uh, just to do this series. Okay, uh, the sermons and everything will modify and amplify this uh, particular theme. Um, four big emphases that you're going to see is church attendance, is being here as much as you possibly can in 2016. And if you're not able to be here, you be a podrishener, okay, and just get on online and be a podrishener and listen online and get caught up that way, okay. Get in a story grow group, that's the second big emphasis. Third big emphasis is Bible literacy. And the fourth, uh, we'll have people leading each of these areas. And then the fourth big emphasis is stewardship. And it's just considering how we can use all of our resources, whatever those might be, and there are many, how we might use those to help our church in uh, serving and being a ministry, reducing debt, and position, positioning us to do better ministry. And so on light, in light of that fourth point, I thought I would bring a couple up on the platform today whom I can ask some questions of. And if you have your bulletin, and we appreciate uh, the bulletin every week and the source of information that it is, so it just takes some time to look that over. But in the bulletin, if you have one today, um, there's a, a couple of, of inserts that we call them, and there's a, like a little 
uh, tear off insert which actually a tear off on the one insert and actually it's it's uh, the smaller little rectangular insert is actually just that this part of the insert blown up and already detached for you okay and then you've got a little biography on here of the couple that I'm going to have come up and so you've met them once already and some of you have met them even more than that just in uh, the weekly sharing and things and would you uh, uh, would you please give a welcome to Mike and Brandy Hatfield thank you I appreciate you guys uh, so much and and the church family appreciates uh, just all the different uh, people that serve and minister here at Stones Hill and um, we were able to, to, yeah, I noticed that you put her closer to the congregation. That's, that's a good move. Okay. Uh, the, uh, uh, the joy of meeting you and getting to know you and things is just awesome. And then also your willingness to help and serve, especially in such a vital capacity as a stewardship area. And so I've got some questions here that uh, we've kind of talked about already and kind of gone over. But I'd just like to ask those questions of you. Have you addressed them so everybody can hear that? Hear, you know, what you're thinking and kind of how we need to think about it. Uh, one of the things you've heard me talk about before, though, is tax-exempt status and, and uh, 501c3 and what that might mean for the church going forward. And so what does tax-exempt status mean? What is that anyway? Yeah. Yeah, oh, uh, good point. Let me see. Yeah, microphone is right here. Yeah. All right, here we go. Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. Yep. Is it on? There you go. Okay, great. Yes. Um, thank you for having us here today. This is a, a very exciting topic and one that we seem to talk about at home almost every day. So we're excited to be here and, yep. and share and, and get to talk about this with you guys. Um, but the tax exempt status, what's, what that means is that the church can accept donations, um, ties and everything from all of us, and uh, that's tax deductible for the donor, for all of you. And um, it's also exempt from federal and state income taxes so the church isn't having to write quarterly tax checks or anything like that it's exempt from property taxes so this you know the beautiful building and the property it sits on is tax exempt and then there's some other things like postage and and things like that that the church can take advantage of from being a tax exempt status okay good uh, very good what, to, what could happen if the church loses tax-exempt status? Well, this is a really, um, a real thing that is happening now. There's people yeah. out there lobbying for this that want to see this happen to the churches. Um, because if a church openly speaks out and organizes against certain things that the government declares as legal, such right. as, um, you know, abortion, homosexuality, gay marriage, those types of things, mm -hmm. if we speak out against that, we could be in jeopardy to lose that status. And it can cause problems for us to say the things that need to be said to lead people down the right paths for yeah. for Christ and um, I think Pastor Joey said it best in a video that he did back in April which is pretty much what fueled this for Michael and I to um, you know when he did it the first time I got goosebumps and when I've watched it every time since then I've gotten goosebumps but I think we should watch it now just yeah. to see go ahead guys what what brought yeah. this all about let's do you know we got a lot well I think we're living in a time when our true colors are going to be seen, you see. I really do. I think they're going to be seen. It's time where the rubber meets the street in America. You're going to live by your Christian values or you're going to cater to a culture that says, okay, you're going to live our way regardless of what God says about it or it's over. Okay? You're going to pay the price. The ultimate price if you don't define it the way we want to define it. And that's just not that issue. If it's this issue, there'll be other issues. I assure you of that. There are other issues on the way. Okay? Now, I don't want to over-dramatize it. But when you're approached someday and you're belligerent, uh, uh, badgered, and manipulated into living contrary to your worldview, then all freedoms, regardless of the issue, then all freedoms are at stake. All of them. 
And so not to engage in the great debates of our time is to make a huge mistake. Church, you cannot be silent. You cannot be gray. You cannot... It's time. It is time to come to a place in your journey with the Savior where no matter what happens, who you're confronted with, what ideology is set before you, are you going to follow Jesus? Are you just going to say, okay, whatever you say, I'll just do it the way you want to do it. I don't care what Jesus says about it, what God says about it. I'll just do it your way. You see, it's not so far removed. There's some people already in the world. In fact, some more even this morning, I think I got on my AP News app. Some Ethiopian Christians. Back in February, there's a group of guys, Coptic Christians from Egypt, who have migrated up to Libya to work and provide for their families. And Coptic Christians in Egypt have a little tattoo on their wrist. A lot of, that's how they do it there. And Coptic Christianity is kind of a, a smaller group within the larger Christian movement. But it's, a, it's a, uh, an Orthodox group. And they have a little tattoo on their wrist. When they're little, they get this little tattoo. Just like that. Just, just like that. Maybe blue. Mine's red. And it's tattooed. Probably on their right, but I'm not right left-handed. I couldn't make that on my right hand. So it's going to be on my wrist, on my left hand. Okay? And they make that. And late one Sunday night, a group of people, you, you've heard them referred to as ISIL or ISIS, decided they're going to round up as many copy Christians as they can find. And they're going to all do it in a night, and they're going to parade these boys out on an ocean, the Mediterranean Sea, in Tripoli, Mediterranean coast there in Libya. And they're going to make a video of these guys, and they're going to make them pay the ultimate price. They called the Nation of the Cross. Refer to our nation as the Nation of the Cross. And the blood that was spilt, Osama bin Laden, dumped in somewhere in the Mediterranean perhaps, they're going to spill our blood, Christian blood, within those waters as well. And they gather up these guys, knocking on doors late at night. Let me see your wrist, let me see your wrist, let me see your wrist. Some of, some fled, some got away, others did not. When they found the, the sign of the cross on their wrist, they gathered those boys together. They found 20 of them. One of them was a, an African. And if you look in the pictures on the internet, you'll see that they all are very Egyptian-like. And then there's an African uh, from the, uh, one of the countries uh, there in Africa that was also part of the 21. And they prayed these boys out, okay? And they have them standing there on the coast. They drop them down to their knee, all right? Drop them down just about like that. And you can see in the video, and I didn't see the execution video. I don't know if you can still see that. I don't know that you would want to. But I could see in some of the video footage and the reports and things, they're saying words. And what the press won't tell you is that they're saying the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. All together. Hold, just holding their, standing their ground. Boys, do you want to recant? Do you want to? No, sir. The Lord Jesus Christ. They drop those boys down right on their faces. I'll just go ahead and do that. Right on their faces. Right like that. On the beach. Here they are. The Lord Jesus Christ. They grab them by the hair of the head. And they expose their necks. And they decapitate them right there. Right there on the beach. I asked you, church... Is this love? Is this love? Get your ducks in a row. Get your house in order. You're going to be called upon. Maybe not in this extreme. You'll be called upon to live out your faith. Don't you bow to it. Don't you bow to the secular agenda. Don't you bow for a second. And I don't know. Maybe I get a privilege of wearing one of these. I don't know. 
I, I don't know what color they are at Albion. I have no idea. Maybe they are orange. It seemed like they are, were orange at one time. Are you going to do that wedding or else? Okay. Well, you know what, guys? You know what? I like orange. It looks nice. Okay. This is a little too much maybe. But I'll be all right. Okay. I'll be all right. Levi's graduating soon. <laughs> He's going to college. Write me in jail. See? That's the way that goes. But uh, I'm not doing a gay marriage. This church is not doing a gay marriage. We'll love you. We'll walk with you. But we're not doing gay marriage. Period. Put it on CNN. We're not doing gay marriage. It's contrary to our worldview, you see. It's not because it's what it doesn't flip our fancy. It's because there's deep underlying biblical reasons why we don't do, we don't mess with the family as God's designed it. Okay? Now we're going to love you. No one will love you more. Amen? No one will love you more. But we're not going to kowtow to any particular sin, legislate, litigate, and try to make it right. Because it destroys God's plan. Now, uh, what I would say, and this is what I would say, just as a way of practical exhortation here, uh, I could see us losing our tax exempt status in days ahead, which means I think I have Barb do the numbers thirty five to forty five thousand a year, I think, and taxes will be assessed. So, what I would say to is, let's get our church paid for. Let's get it paid for. What do we, elder elder members? What do we owe in the church? Somebody tell me. Some you guys see the statements? What's our numbers? Okay, it's a lot of money. Okay, but we're down to how many years of payments? Was it about nine or ten remaining? Was that what it is, guys? Eight or nine? years of payments and we'll have that paid for based on what we're currently paying okay well you know what I never thought that this could be a motivation for that but listen let's free ourselves up you stay faithful in your giving let's get ourselves covered here let's get things paid for and then when we're the government says 45,000 you're not doing gay marriage 45,000 you get some jail time 45,000 we're subpoenaing your sermons Nelson hand them over okay otherwise here's you some assessed bills okay when we get there we're all ready it's fine we're paid for or we're nearly paid for Levi's in college I'm ready to go to jail and you guys get to come and see me for once alright alright this is a start now I know I can just see that Tumblr that Tumblr website's going to fire up okay those blog the blog questions here they come boom boom zing zing just watch out for autocorrect okay alright let's pray together and after I say amen we're going to hear, hear some more Percy in Jesus' name. All right, here we go. The Sunday we danced at church. Uh, and even if, even if uh, thanks for, for, I never watch myself, so it's nice to look at how goofy I look. And it, that way I can improve. So thank you for, thank you for insisting we show it. But uh, the thing is, even if the, the loss of tax exempt status does not become a policy for non-gay affirming churches, okay, even if it doesn't, there are other things that a church on teaching on various points of truth that they stand to lose their tax exempt status, especially if you address issues that the, uh, the government or other people would view as political. And some churches have lost their, their tax exempt status that way. And so my concern is that we be an independent voice. We speak with nobody looking over our shoulder. We teach the Bible with nobody manipulating or trying to uh, coerce us into a viewpoint that happens to be culturally popular at the moment. Okay? And that's where we want to be as a church is in a position to be an independent voice speaking truth from on top of the hill here in this little rural Indiana town that can reverberate out not only in our lives, in our world views, but as her kids go to college, get married, as we move around the world, they will have had the privilege 
of being raised in a Bible teaching church loves all people of all agendas yes we do loving all people but having a very clear understanding of what the truth is what love is how those two are married together and how we can live that out in a way that lifts up Jesus Christ amen that's what we want to be and that's what's really behind us now enough with me that's what I want to say listen let's come back to the question all right what other things may be related to this that you'd like to share today? Okay, in the video, it was hard to hear, uh, but when that was done, the church balance on the building was at 502,000. Yeah. Now it's around uh, 492,000. So we are plugging our way yeah. to getting that taken care of. Um, so I just wanted to clear that up because it was very hard to hear in, yes. the, in the video. But uh, for the donors, this could mean that their contributions are no longer tax exempt or tax deductible I mean so when you have that little line on your taxes it says how much have you given to charity this year yes and it helps you it could no longer help you in that situation and for the church it means that those things now become taxed it now becomes income to the church and that's where the 35,000 to 45,000 number would come in at for the donations that come into the church and the property taxes that would need to be paid associated with that. Um, it could mean that banks that are holding church loans could be penalized. It could cause the uh, bank to call the loan or banks to no longer loan out money to churches, which would be a horrible thing to have happen that no ch new churches could be built or that they would loan it out at an incredibly high interest rate. We have to be ready for this, you guys. A thirty-five to forty-five thousand dollar tax bill coming in—that's ten to thirteen percent of our budget. Where is it going to come from? I mean, the budget's pretty maxed out right. as it is. So we have to be prepared for this. We need to be prepared for this situation before the situation happens, and know what we're going to do and how we're going to take care of it. And police officers practice for, you know driving and shooting and domestic violence and sports teams practice for the big game and we date before we marry we have to practice for that tax bill and know where it's gonna where we're gonna get the money from when the time comes for that well uh, talk just a minute uh, to why this mission is why it matters and why it's so urgent because I kind of sense that from you and just in maybe the video as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna um, actually let Michael take this portion yeah. of it. <laughs> so we're kind of skipping around back there a little bit. So um, if you sure. go to slide four, ooh, hey, I'm like Pastor yes. Joey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but before we talk about why this is so important, yeah. I think we should talk about some of the missions and values of the church. Okay. And I think as we look at those, you'll see why it's so important to get the debt out of the way. Good. Well, unfortunately, this time I didn't get to just sit here like last time. I was kind of hoping that was going to be the case, but it didn't work out that way. <laughs> um, well, basically, is what Brandy was saying. Um, the mission of our church is that we want to lead people to God's forgiveness and see them restored to all that God created them to be. On the front of your bulletin every week. Yep. So that's that's definitely one of the important things that we want to follow is because if if we don't have a chance to present God to people, then again, it's the world will become a lot darker than where it's already at. Yep. And this is to help prepare for the fact that in case changes do come to the church. Um, I guess we could go to the next slide, which is the process of the church. And basically in this slide, what we're showing is that the church is all about connecting, which we talked about this morning, growing, serving, and connecting with the community and also growing in your spiritual life or your ability to serve others. That's what we learn part of what we learn in the process through the mission of the church. Um, I guess the next thing we would talk about is the values, um, some of the core values that are the top priorities at our church here is that it's very God-centered as Pastor Joey talks about all the time following the Bible. Uh, we're people-centered. Uh, we do follow the family, which we find is very important as participant, which is all of us. Um, 
Oh, I already skipped ahead. There's the Bible. The Bible has Senate, joined. Yeah. It's all on the back, <laughs> on the back page of the bulletin. Yeah, yep. and the community, which is our area that we live in, and uh, th that we want to be disciple-centered. So again, growing outside of here and growing to fill in the uh, empty seats that we have in the church, which never really noticed from back there. You do kind of see there are some empty seats up here. So maybe we can work on getting that more filled up also. Yeah. Um, I guess my last slide that I have to participate in at this particular moment is how we put these all together, which would be slide seven. Um, and basically this talks about people mattering to God and how they matter to us. So I guess I can read it to you. It sure. says, so when an individual journeys with this people-centered group of Christ followers, they will experience God's forgiveness because that's kind of what we're trying to show. Um, they'll maybe be nudged towards restoring their life um, through the Bible-centered messages because obviously that's where we get our walking papers from. Um, they're connected to, are encouraged to connect with others in God-centered worship experiences, which is basically here. Um, and some of the other things that we do, um, the family-centered ministries and classes, which we talked about some new ones coming now, um, disciple-centered mentoring relationships, so hopefully we could help others, and grow in their walk with God and their relationship with others. And basically you're encouraged to apply this and live it out in your world and the things that you do. Amen. Very good. Um, would there, would there, would it be appropriate to ask the question, what are some of the things that we might be seeing or hearing, and I'm skipping around too, yeah. but what are some of the things we might be seeing or hearing, and if there's something else you want to hit before you get there, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Let me, uh, well, could we go back just one little bit? Yeah. <laughs> when we got looking at these, um, the mission and values and things of the church, we, we got to talking, Michael and I did, of, you know, what is standing in the way of us doing more of this, doing more of the community outreach and more classes and supporting our missions to the fullest extent and, and doing everything that, that we can to win one more for the kingdom. And the biggest thing that was standing in the way was what Pastor Joey said in his video with the orange jumpsuit, and it's the building debt. And we have to get that out of the way and eliminate that. So that's where we're going to be going in in the future with this and there's going to be you know, various things coming out, Bible studies, daily readings, all church brochure that's going to talk about the missions and values, you know, where we are now, where we'd like to be, things we want to see coming, you know, down the road once we can get the building out of the way. There's so many other things that we can do to further the kingdom. And so we'll be seeing, you'll be seeing a lot of that come into play come 2016 in various uh, documents and on the uh, Bible app. I'm not good with electronic you stuff. Yeah. You version. Yeah. <laughs> Those things. You'll be seeing a lot more stuff come through there. Awesome. Um, what are maybe some things that we can start thinking about in terms of helping? I know we've got some stuff in the bulletin as a, a communication piece that people can can yes. share with us and but there is a insert in the bulletin that has a bunch of items that we'll be needing for this specific campaign campaign for people to assist with but it's not just about this campaign it's about our stewardship for the entire mm -hmm. church and everything that goes on here it takes a lot of people to make everything that we see happen i've had the pleasure of working at churches before to know what all goes on behind the scenes mm -hmm. to, to know how many people it really does take to get this going um, and the church only has you know six paid people on staff which for a church this size is relatively small so it takes a lot of us to fill the shoes that need to be filled to pull this off to do church and everyone needs to do their part the church staff needs to have the the confidence to know that when they get up here and say we need greeters that they're going to have a lot of people step up and say, well, I could do that. Or I need help with a funeral dinner. Well, I can do that. So the church needs to have, the church staff needs to have the, the security and the faith in knowing that we're going to be here to take care of them. It's our responsibility mm -hmm. to take care 
of the entire staff and each other. Yeah, and the, I really appreciate the people of Stones Hill just making those things happen week after week after week and have been so faithful to do that over the years. So we um, will also want to express appreciation for your commitment to help us be that kind of a church that these guys have described. Well... Wahoo! Yes, <laughs> yes. And uh, the... Uh, uh, what specifically can we pray for? And if people are interested in helping, what would you say to that? I guess that everyone would pray for the, the pastoral staff here. That they're going to be able to continue to get up there in their orange jumpsuit or whatever color it may be and speak the truth to us every single Sunday without having outside influence tell them that they're not allowed to do that anymore. I don't know about you, but I would rather have Pastor Joey speak the truth to me than any political leader. So I'm not sure if they know the truth. Yeah, the Bible speaks. Yes. It, if we just teach the Bible, <laughs> it preaches. And that's, I'm with you. I want that to inform my worldview more than some current ideology or trend. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, pray that God will show each and every one of you what your story is going to be come 2016 yeah. in this whole sermon series yeah. and in this giving campaign and what your portion is going to be in helping to eliminate that debt. And um, I would just like to throw in, you don't have to wait till 2016. If yeah. you would like to start helping, you know, to eliminate that debt, we would appreciate that. That'd yes. be great. Let's start today. <laughs> it could be one of the shortest debt reduction campaigns in history. It could. It could be. 2016's done already. <laughs> it uh, could. We'd like yeah. to have it done in 2016. If we accomplish it before then, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Um, for every family and individual and business of the church to decide how they're going to sacrifice and participate in this, sacrifice is what it's all about. Yeah. Nothing good has ever been achieved without sacrifice. And this is a great challenge and all of us need to do our part to sacrifice in that. Yeah. And the miracle of uh, generosity on Commitment Day, which will be in uh, January, unless we're done before that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so in January for everyone to make their commitments for the 2016 year. Amen. Would there be any other info on the slides? Did we miss anything that was important or imperative? Uh, yeah. You had about 14 or 15. Was there anything else? And we we'll, we'll, we can come back to a few things later. Yeah. We can okay. Um, can we talk about why this is our responsibility? Yeah, let's do that and close close our time together okay. with that. Yeah. I just want to share with uh, everyone why this is our responsibility. I did not know this until I started meeting with the elder board, but the elders, past and present, they're securing this loan for all of us. It's their name that's on this loan, and. That's our responsibility to take care of. They stepped out and had the faith to do it for all of us. We have to step out and have the faith to now eliminate this debt so we can go out and do something else. Uh, we got to do it to be good stewards of money. And uh, I think Pastor Joey said it best. If the building's paid off, what, what do we have to lose? Okay. So, that's all. I just I, wanted to make sure to, you know, you know, it is our job. It's our responsibility. It is. <laughs> and you you both have done such a great job. I mean, you've touched on the vision of the church, vision statements, core value statements on uh, in the bulletin. So that's really what this is about. It's a bigger yes to those things than anything else. But it happens to be that we're not in a, a vacuum. We live in a very crazy, tumultuous world with a lot of uh, ideas floating around out there. And we want to just be a clear voice for truth in the days ahead. That's what I sense is really behind all of this. And so let's just affirm this couple with uh, a, a thank God and an applause. We'll come back and have you come back another time, okay? To some of these things. Yeah, you did great. Thank you so much for, for uh, sharing with us, guys. I really appreciate it. And we want to thank you also. Uh, some of you had a vision to birth Stone Hill Community Church many years ago. You came up here on the hill. You, you, you put a, uh, poured a foundation. You framed this thing in. You had some obstacles. You overcame those. And you've stuck with this church family for many, many years. And I want to say thank you. I'm one life that's been changed. 
I would have never known Ligonier, Indiana. I would have never known West Noble High Schools and the teachers and the staff. I would have never known my neighbors in Circle Drive, wonderful neighbors there. I would have never been a part of this network of relationships if somebody some one day, many, many years ago, had said, I think it's time to birth something new. And you did. And this thing is here, and I'm here. I've been here now 10 plus years simply because somebody had a vision and a dream of that. And I want to thank you for staying with it for all these years. And now it's been a joy to lead you and to preach to you and proclaim truth. And I hope that you, that you uh, feel the love of the Lord and the commitment to something that's bigger than us. Something that will outlive us. And we all need to have that as part of our legacy. And so this is an opportunity for each of us. No matter how old we are. Each of us to partner with something that's bigger than us and that will live on in an enduring way in our community in the world ahead. We're not about hate here. In fact, if you have no idea how safe you are with me and many of the people in the church, no matter what your gender is or what your orientations may be and what your worldviews are, you have no idea how much you'd be loved. But we love you enough and we love the Lord enough to say, you know what, God, we want to build our lives on your truth it's not what makes me happy. It's not what makes you happy. It's what makes us wholly set apart and truly, truly joy-filled in the long run. And so that's what we want to hold up as our greatest act of worship, as our greatest act of consecration. And so we just want to invite you up into that today. There's a lot of things that I could say uh, more on this, and we will just save it for upcoming days. And we've got maybe... Um, we'll see what time we got. We got about seven, eight minutes left here this morning. And I just want to uh, touch on a couple of things. And then uh, we'll try to, try to get you out of here uh, in a timely fashion. And one of the things I want to mention just by way of, of just some Bible teaching here this morning. Is that as I was looking at uh, Second, Third John. I decided to dig a little bit deeper into the life of John. And I think his life lesson to all of us is an incredible statement. Makes an incredible statement. Because when John started following Jesus, he, was, he wasn't so much a lover of Jesus, though he definitely became that. He was really about himself in a lot of ways. And I think we can see that as we look into the life of, of Apostle John. He was probably a teenager, middle teenager, maybe 15, 16 years of age. He was the one whom Jesus loved. Jesus loved little teenager John. He was like the youngest of the 12. And he, uh, he loved to kind of uh, take him under his wing and mentor him and love him and shape him and train him and, and, and did some wonderful things. But John wasn't always this omnicompetent apostle that we see later as he writes these letters of 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the Gospel of John. He was a very flawed and blemished individual. And I want you to see that because... Uh, sometimes we think, well, I've got to be omnicompetent or, or I've got to be this, you know, this super spiritual guy or gal. And unless I'm this way, unless I, my life is at this level where John is when we see him writing these letters, you know, it's like, well, something's, you know, wrong, something's deficient in my faith journey. And, um, and I want you to see that it wasn't always that way for John and that when Jesus chose the apostles, he chose great lovers. Not omnicompetent guys. Great lovers. How do I know? They all died for him. And John would have, they tried to execute him, but he survived. And that's what I want to tell you. Be a great lover. A great lover of Christ. Love him above everything. Commit your life to him. Amplify him in, every, in, in everything that you believe, in the way you live. Be a great lover. More than anything else. More than just competent. Be a lover. And that's what these guys were. You see, when we look at John, like every reliable source in early church history, they attest to the fact that John became the pastor of a church that had been founded in Ephesus probably by Apostle Paul. And he later became the pastor of that congregation. Uh, he had left Jerusalem by the 70 AD destruction of, before the 70 AD destruction of Jerusalem by uh, Titus, the Roman uh, leader and general. And later, 
when a great persecution broke out against the church, the Roman emperor Domitian at the time uh, condemned John to execution. He was being boiled in a hot cauldron of oil. And his persecutors and executioners had p compassion on him and rescued him from this hot boiling cauldron of, of oil. He was later banished to a prison community on the Isle of Patmos. Slide number 12 is, uh, is the place you could go here, guys. Just to kind of give a visual, I think these are the Dodecanese Islands today in the Aegean Sea off the west coast of modern-day Turkey. And John, oh, Apostle John, old teenager John, who, had, who was rough around the edges, and we'll see how he was in just a second. This, this uh, elder in the church, this, this saintly, wisdom-filled person that we see in these letters, and we've seen in 2 John, we're going to see in 3 John. This older man now, later in years, he spent several months in this confined, in this, uh, in this, uh, in this island location, uh, and this is incidentally where he wrote the book of Revelation. Or at least he re, uh, received the vision, the apocalyptic visions that he describes in the book of Revelation. But it was a harsh environment for an older man. Uh, John was cut off from the people he loved. He was treated with cruelty. He was reproached as an enemy of the Roman state. He, he slept on a stone slab. He had a rock for a pillow. And that's how this older man who had one of the last surviving witnesses of the Christ event. That's some of the ways that he spent the latter part of his life. He was finally released though from this island captivity as, as uh, extra biblical sources tell us. And he died in 98 AD. And one of the church fathers, Jerome by name, said that John was so frail in his final days. Now picture it. This frail, almost broken older man He's been through a lot. He's been boiled. He's been relegated and exiled to an island called Patmos. He's struggled with life. He's, he's tried to take care of Mary, the mother of Jesus, the best he could and the best he the, fulfilled that promise that he made to Jesus while he was giving up his last breast on a cross. He's done his best that he could. And, and Jerome tells us that in the final days in the church of Ephesus, he had to be carried to church. No wheelchairs. Or, he, he was carried in on a cot. They propped him up so he could be a part of the service. He wanted to be there with these people he called Christians. And the world knew as Christians. Christ-loving people. People-loving people. He wanted to be at church and they carried him in. And one of the phrase, if they ever asked for a testimony, anybody got a testimony today? Anybody got a thought they'd like to share with the congregation? Every Sunday, every time they met, John would put his hand in the air the best he could. And he'd say, my little children love one another. That's about all he could get out. My little children love each other. I think it's powerful. All the things that he could have said and all the things that he probably thought, the one thing that he could muster the strength to say is, would you, you guys just love each other? Really love each other. It's the Lord's command, he would say. And if, if this alone be done, it is enough. You see, John, he knew of Calvary love. There was a time in his life, we'll hit, we'll hit this quickly, he was fiery and hot-headed, slide number seven. Jesus nicknamed him, the son, him and his brother James, the sons of thunder. Uh, he, he was noted for these intense emotional responses and there was something of a thunderstorm in everything that John was about in his early teenage years it overshadowed everything else he was strong of spirit he was in layman's terms he was a hothead John was a young teenage hothead self-assertive ambitious zealous explosive Responds with, he would respond with a sectarian, narrow-minded, unbending, reckless frame of mind. If somebody uh, snubbed him or, or offended him or said something they shouldn't have said, somebody said a disparaging remark about his family or about his ethnicity or, or about his favorite team or politician, he would fire up and he would sulk or snap or sneer or snub or storm. That was John. 
That was, that was pre-Calvary John. Fiery and hot-headed. Slide number eight tells us in another place in the Gospels, he was prejudiced and intolerant. In fact, when the Samaritans refused to welcome his Savior and hero, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he had seen transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, probably Mount Hermon, he sees this snubbing, he sees how they have offended his hero, and he's so ticked off, he says, God, Jesus, he says, if you'll just enable me, I'll call down fire from heaven, we'll zap the whole village, just take care of them. For treating you with such disdain and disrespect. That was, that was pre-Calvary John. That was pre-boiled in a cauldron John. That was pre-apocalyptic uh, vision John. That was pre-Calvary John. Well, we read a little later, slide number nine. John was also prejudiced and intolerant. And what's crazy is that Jesus is going on his way to Jerusalem to die a death for all of us. He's going to be flogged and crucified. He says point blank in, the, in Matthew 20 verse 19 what's going to happen when he gets to Jerusalem. And get this guys, John is so prejudiced and intolerant, he's so hot-headed, he's so prideful and insensitive, prideful and insensitive, that while Jesus is on his way to die on a cross, John and James talk to their mom into going and asking a personal favor of Jesus. When you come into your kingdom, let this boy sit on your left and this boy sit on your right. Wow. Can you believe that? How insensitive could you be? Jesus is going to be sweating great blots, gro uh, drops of blood in a matter of days. And these guys are jockeying for position in positions in the kingdom. Whoa. Jesus, can you do a better job of picking your followers? Come on, man. This guy is so bush league. He's so amateur. He's just so far from what he should be as a Jesus follower. Selfish ambition ate him up. Well, the truth is, John is a lot like you and me. It's a lot like us. Hot-headed, fiery when somebody pushes our buttons, prejudiced and intolerant. Prideful and insensitive. We've got a battle to fight in the world and, and we, we're going to worry about what seat we get to sit in and whether or not our stories are published and Jesus is on his way to die on a cross. You see, these are pre-Calvary pictures of John and they're pre-Calvary pictures of you and me. But something happened in old, old Apostle John that changed him. And after Calvary's love was poured out on a cross, after he was attempted ex the attempted execution in a cauldron of boiling oil, after a stone for a bed, a, 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 a slab for a bed, a stone for a pillow, old John started to love more. And he never loved before. Life had a way of humbling him. And he was so, so uh, powerful in the latter years of his life. Because he saw the need of people to be loved. And he kept talking about love over and over and over again. And as he grew older, he became the apostle of love. And it becomes, if you study the Gospel of John and First and Second, Third John and the Revelation, especially though the, the, the previous four books, three books I, that I mentioned, four books, and especially if you, if you study those, you see this well-developed theme of love that threads all the verses and thoughts and themes and, and thesis together. It's just all throughout the, 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 the writings of John. He keeps coming back to love and truth. Truth and love. Living it out. Loving people in the greatest possible way. Never stop loving. Until he's older in his life and he's shaky and he puts up his hand and says, I got a testimony. 
Will you do? Will you love each other? He says, Will you just love with abandon? You see, he, life had taught him something. In fact, John talks about God as love. He says God loved his own son. He said God loved the world. Christ loved God. Christ loved his disciples. Christ's disciples loved him. That we should love one another. And he never got off that sermon or that note. He kept coming back to it over and over and over again. Because life had taught him something. Calvary's love had taught him something. And there is no greater thing than love. Well, he became known as the elder. He was kind and loving and wise and seasoned and balanced and fair and truthful and honest. Far from the bigoted, hot-headed, prejudicial, uh, selfish ambition-driven man that he used to be. And to all this I say only Christ. Only Christ. You see, Jesus, when he chooses world changers... He surprises us sometimes because he never seems to choose omnicompetent disciples who are these expert spiritual growth people. He just chooses lovers. People that just love him and they won't stop. And they love him so much they endeavor to love other people. And so I would just add, I would just lay that out before you today. That Maybe if you'll ch choose today to be a, the greatest lover of Christ you can be, that maybe you'll love others in ways that you never have. Um, if Jesus gave you a nickname, what would it be today? For John, it was a stormy lightning bolt of sons of thunder. But what might your nickname be? What might your new name be? You see, if we're ugly and Jesus names us beautiful, if we're weak and Jesus names us strong, and He will, He makes us strong and beautiful. He gives us a new identity. And maybe that's what you need today. Do we have any testimonies today? Do we have any here at the Church of Ephesus? Do we have anybody that'd like to give us a word? Oh, yeah. Okay, John. What, what, you, what you got to say, John? My little children love one another. The great John. The four or five biblical author John. Reduces it all down. Love one another. Well, we heard that last week, John. Anything new? We heard that two months ago, John. Anything new? We just love what you love. Let's pray. Thank you, God for this day. Thank you for this group. Thank you for the investment of, our, of their time and our time together here this morning. And if we don't accomplish anything else in life, could it be said of us? No, we're not omnicompetent disciples. No, no. May it be said of us. We had that theme of love on our lips, lived out in our life, and we never got off that note. And John would say it is enough. If we would just love one another. Now who do we love? need to love today? What wife or husband do we need to love? What child do we need to love? What new name do you want to speak over the people who are here this morning? Some of us would say, well, if I had a nickname, Jesus, maybe he'd call me money bags. Maybe that's all I've been about in my life. Or maybe he would, he would call me, uh, I don't know, maybe my name would be... Um, uh, Mr. Nosy or Mrs. Gossip or maybe my maybe my story would be uh, you know uh, who I have to step on this week to get the position I want maybe these are all pre-Calvary names but seeing the beauty of love and the beauty of one who lived it out Maybe today our name could be new. You can take that selfish ambition and mold it into Christ ambition where we're everything about our life. We're going to strive for excellence. We're going to give God the glory. We're going to lift Him up no matter what. It's about Him, not me. Maybe that's it. 
Maybe you'll take our hot-headed, uh, push my political buttons uh, disposition and maybe we'll become so passionate about the kingdom of God in the world and about the vision to reach and restore lives. Maybe that'll be a bigger, a bigger yes. And we'll give ourselves to that so much more. Maybe some of the other things. And maybe today we'll set aside our pride and our prejudices. And maybe we'll embrace somebody. Maybe they speak a different language. Maybe they work a different job. Maybe they have a different color of skin. Maybe they have a different ethnicity. Maybe they're in a different social status bracket. Maybe they're in a different financial bracket. But I just see that old quaky arm of John lifted high there in that Ephesian church many years ago. 98, 80 or so. I see that hand lifted up. John, is there a testimony today? Is there a testimony church? Oh, that we might love. That we might love one another. That's the message. That's the new name. Great lovers of Jesus. The name, we proclaim it over every individual here today. You, sir. You, John. You, Wes. Uh, you, Bob, you, Susan, you, Malin, you were a great lover of Jesus. And that's enough. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been a great group. Stand with me, okay? We're going to let you go. Come next week. Read ahead. Third John's where we're headed. Very practical, very hard-hitting. We'll see you next week, okay? Blessings.